Uh, okay, we, we are now uh, we are now live streaming. Welcome to uh, this week's uh, transport for the North Scrutiny Committee meeting. Just before we start, I'd just like to remind members that if they could keep themselves on mute uh, during the presentation, and um, if you've got concerns about bandwidth, then you uh, switch your cameras off. But when you do wish to speak, or when you're invited to speak, if you would uh, both put your camera on and unmute yourself. Um, if we could use the chat box for uh, uh, questions, then I will, or one of the officers will pick up that uh, a question is, is being raised and that we need to pick that question up. Um, so it, 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 I think hopefully those are those instructions OK. Is everybody clear about that? Thank you. Uh, so um, I'll move on to uh, today's agenda. Uh, welcome, as I say, everybody. We've got a number of apologies. Um, uh, Gary, can you uh, provide us with the apologies, please? Yeah, we've had apologies from Councillor Mordy, Councillor Jones and Councillor Davison. Thank you. Does anybody here have apologies on behalf of anyone else at all? Uh, yes, Chair. D uh, David Hughes here, um, Strategy Programme Director at TFN. Barry White currently uh, off sick, actually, so I'm covering for Barry as Acting CEO at the moment, so apologies from Barry. Oh, well, thank you and welcome, and uh, I look forward to your... Uh, uh, your, your interjections today. Are there any other uh, apologies at all? And uh, I hope that Barry gets well soon. I hope he'll have our good wishes. Okay. Um, so could we have uh, could we have um, uh, discussed the previous uh, minutes? I believe we've already had one question come in against the minutes. Uh, are there any other points about the minutes before I? seek to find a proposer and a seconder subject to one, uh, one or more alterations that might be requested. I presume that's my query, Chair. Uh, uh, Councillor yeah. Parrish, it is indeed. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Councillor Hughes, would you like to uh, just come in and, and explain the two that you... Uh, Phoenix, that you feel uh, we just need to get corrected? Um, yes, thanks, Chair. Well, Councillor Parrish has already flagged up the uh, somewhat uh, spaghetti-like phrasing of one, one of the sentences on page seven. And I think I'm sure we all agree that um, the, the fourth paragraph on page seven should say east of Leeds Station as the whole or something similar. Perhaps we can have a, an officer um, statement on that. And also in the second paragraph, i.e. higher up, there's a word missed out. It, the text says addressing the of the eastern leg. And I assume that means it should say question or something like that. Or issue. So, so I can confirm that uh, Councillor uh, Parrish is absolutely correct. Uh, I've reworded that paragraph uh, and that has now been sent to all uh, members of the scrutiny committee. So I would look, Chair, for that to be reinserted uh, and thank both councillors for picking up that point. It is the full electrification from east of Leeds Station out to Hull Paragon Station and then via our new lines, full electrification from Leeds via Bradford into Manchester and then from Manchester on our new line out through Warrington and over to Liverpool. That will then give you full east-west electrification and also the electrification piece coming out of east of Leeds via the HS2 proposed Garford touchpoint up towards uh, Ullerskelf, connecting to the East Coast Main Line and, of course, up to Newcastle. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, I hope that uh, satisfies the uh, two people that have pointed that out. I think it does. What do you say, uh, Steve? Are you okay there, Steve? I'm fine with that, yeah. Thank you. So, therefore, could I have a proposer and a seconder for the minutes, please, with that uh, alteration that has been provided by Tim? Thank you. Well, I'll do it then. Okay. So, it's proposed by uh, Councillor Parrish and the seconder, please. I'm happy to second that. Okay. Um, 
Uh, I think probably the easiest way to uh, do this is, are there any objections to the, uh, to the minutes uh, being agreed now? And if anybody has any objections, could they just put that in the chat box, please? OK, I'll take that as uh, carried. Uh, we now get to item four, and this is an annual event, uh, appointment of chair and vice chairs. So I'm now going to hand over uh, to Councillor Hughes uh, as one of the vice chairs uh, for him to uh, organise and present the election for the appointment of a chair. Thank you. Over to you, uh, Councillor Hughes, please. Thank you, Paul. So I'm simply at this stage seeking nominations for chair of the scrutiny committee. This is open to any members of the committee and the nominations similarly clearly can be made by any members of the committee. So I'd like a proposer and a seconder, please. And if you type um, your, your support, if that's the case, in the box, that would be very uh, welcome. Thank you. I will nominate Paul Haslam. And um, who, who is that, please? I can't. Harris. Okay, Harris. thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. And do I have a seconder, please, as well? Happy to second, uh, Councillor Haslam. And that's Councillor Salter, is it? Yeah. It is indeed. Yeah, thanks very much indeed. Um, do we have any further nominations for consideration, please? I'll give you about um, 10 seconds. <laughs> I don't hear any or see any, so um, congratulations to Paul, and um, I think I hand the meeting back over to, to you again, Paul, at this stage. You are re-elected, uh, you know, um, uncontested as chair. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to keep this role, so thank you very much. Um, over the last year, I think all of us have contributed to making scrutiny um, a, a, a much stronger body. So thank you for that and thank you for your support. And I will continue to do that uh, to make sure that uh, Scrutiny has a strong voice within uh, Transport for the North. Uh, it's now, uh, now down to me to uh, nominate uh, or to take the nominations for uh, vice chairs. There should be two vice chairs, one for the uh, majority party uh, um, and one for a minority party. Um, is that correct, Debbie? Yes, Chair, that's correct. So if uh, I could have nominations for the majority party, uh, please. Uh, and I'm, I'm guessing that Manisha may well want to take this, but I believe she's not here today. But I don't know if anybody has heard from her at all on this. But I tell you what, we'll just hang on uh, in case uh, Manisha comes on the line. Let's take uh, the minority party uh, 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 nomination. Are there any nominations uh, for vice chair? OK, thank you for that, Martin. Uh, I'll uh, deal with that one in a second. Thank you, Neil. So uh, on the minority uh, Minority Party Chair, is there anyone else prepared to stand? We have, uh, I have a, a nomination of uh, uh, Neil Hughes, uh, and, and I'm happy to second that. Uh, so are, are there any other nominations uh, for, uh, for uh, Minority Vice Chair? Okay, well, congratulations, Neil. Uh, that's, uh, that's you. Um, Thanks to all. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, we have a proposer uh, for the uh, 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 for the uh, for the majority uh, for the majority vice chair. Uh, uh, what we don't know is whether Manisha is prepared to stand or not. Uh, so I can leave. Can I leave this one over? Uh, Jeremy, Deb could we can defer this item to next meeting, if that is preferred. OK, well, we I'll just defer it to later in this meeting. OK, well, what I'd like to do then, if uh, the members are agreeable uh, for the um, 
uh, majority vice chair, I'd like to either hold that over until Manisha arrives to find out whether she's prepared to, to, to stand uh, or continue, and continue in that role, or, or we'll take it at the next meeting. Still need a seconder, even if she's willing to stand. <laughs> yeah. OK, we have it. Uh, oh, yes, that's true. That's true. So, but I'd like to just take the. Uh, are there any other nominations for this particular uh, post at this stage? Chair, can I suggest, as there are no nominations, it is deferred to the next meeting. Thank you. Uh, we'll defer this to the next meeting, and then we will, uh, so we can uh, we can progress. Um, so thank you very much for nominating. We're now on item five, but just before we move to item five, I'd just like to say that we've tried to keep the items on this particular agenda uh, slightly fewer so that we have more time to scrutinize these things. So the next item is, um, is Transport for the North's response to uh, the Department for Transport's decarbonization, decarbonization, decarbonizing transport uh, um, setting the challenge publication. Uh, so we actually also have a letter related this, to this. So before we actually start that, I would like to ask uh, if uh, Deborah would read the letter for us, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, members will appreciate that under the Constitution, we do allow public participation in the Scrutiny Committee with the agreement of the Chair. And in the absence of um, a face-to-face -face meeting, in the case of a virtual meeting, we have received a, a letter from the environmental transport organisations um, with recommendations on transport for the North's response to the DFT's decarbonisation, decarbonising transport publication. Rather than read the whole letter, we'll put the letter in the minutes of the meeting. Now I'll just read um, some of the more salient points that have been made. So they say, our note said that the strategic transport plan of Transport for the North had rightly recognized that TFN cannot achieve carbon reduction from transport on its own, and that therefore the single most important action that could assist this would be if the Department for Transport were to provide a clear transport decarbonisation policy framework. It should be a quantified pathway built up from the development of scenario variants compliant at the end of CB5 milestone in 2032 with the CCC's sectoral cost effective paths within their overall net zero trajectory. They're calling for a single pathway including international aviation and shipping emissions, and a pathway that is coordinated with and directive of the decarbonisation pathways now being developed by subnational transport bodies such as Transport for the North, city regions and local authorities, and relevant agencies such as Highways England. They go on to say that it seems to the organisations that the Subnational transport bodies operate at exactly the right geographical institutional scale to take the forthcoming national decarbonisation framework and then apply and coordinate it down through the subsidiary levels beneath. And on that basis, they would urge you, the committee, to consider adding the positive potential that this mediating role for subnational transport bodies represents to our cons consultation response and to recommend it to other STBs for them also to support. So, Chair, that's the, uh, the main salient points from the letter. Paul, you're on. Chair, you're on mute. I can, I can tell I'm on mute. Uh, it's a message that's just flashed up, so apologies. Uh, it happens to the, the best and the worst of us. Um, at least uh, uh, my picture is, is fine, and there's no children in the picture at the moment. Uh, dogs could arrive any time. 
Uh, what I'd like to suggest with this particular item is that we uh, that perhaps uh, we discuss this, uh, and I'll try and take a list. Uh, I will keep a list of all the recommendations that get put forward, and then at the end of this item, I will read back the, a list of the recommendations that have perhaps been put forward for members, and we can agree either all or some of them, such that um, uh, we actually. Um, uh, we actually uh, have a summary at the end uh, of those detail those detailed items. So I would like to hand over to uh, Lucy, who is going to present this item. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Good morning. Um, it's actually going to be jointly presented by myself and our new principal environmental and sustainability officer, Peter Cole. So I'll give a bit of context. I'll let Peter run through kind of the headlines uh, in terms of. Uh, our response and then we'll open it up to kind of comments and questions. So just to kind of recap and, and we'll take the kind of papers as read, but um, in March, uh, DFT published a document called Setting the Challenge, um, which essentially uh, provided a, a whole raft of kind of background information around um, decarbonisation and, and what um, kind of the trajectories and what needs to be done. Um, the setting the challenge document wasn't um, an official consultation. It was very much a start of an ongoing engagement process, which DFT kind of planned to take forward across the summer, of which has been a number of kind of workshops held, which DFN and uh, local partners have been involved in. Uh, we've also kind of engaged with DFT in a number of one-to-one -one conversations around what we would expect the transport decarbonisation plan, which they're looking to publish later this year to kind of include and provide clarity on. Um, since then, DFT have come out and said that they would like uh, formal responses to the Setting the Challenge publication uh, at the very latest by the end of August, um, because they are drafting the transport decarbonisation plan within the first uh, couple of weeks of September um, to support that uh, publication by the end of December. So as such, and based off conversations we've had previously with, uh, with scrutiny, with our strategic oversight group, with executive board, with TFN board, we've started to kind of draft a response around what we would expect the transport decarbonisation plan to, to kind of consider really and to really draw out. Um, so that has been uh, circulated to scrutiny um, as an appendix to this, the draft version of that report. Um, in addition to scrutiny, we uh, presented uh, a very similar item last week to our executive board and took some positive feedback and, and some com comments from members there. So we've been revising that draft slightly, albeit it's mainly just around soft messaging, nothing in terms of the, the, um, the main uh, kind of salient points that we're trying to make within that response. Um, it's also important for scrutiny to understand that this has been uh, circulated to our partners for our strategic oversight group as well. So again, there's, there's, there's been a number of opportunities for partners to provide feedback and comment, help shape the response before we will submit it to DFT this Friday. Um, I'll hand over now to kind of Peter, uh, firstly to kind of introduce him as our, our new kind of lead on decarbonisation, who's going to pick this up from me moving forward also to kind of briefly summarise kind of the key messages in our response before we'll open it up to comment and questions. Thanks, Lucy, and hello, everybody. Um, so, yes, the, the, the key messages um, that have sort of dropped out of our response um, for government would be um, the need for a quantified national pathway to net zero um, and, and a clear functional policy framework. Um, and and if that's done at a national level, that allows it, it becomes much easier for us to start to do that at subnational levels. Um, the need for certainty on, on roles of national and local government, as well as subnational transport bodies and the private sector. Um, the, the need for a clear decision on road user charging for all roads, not just the strategic road net, net network. Uh, the need to de develop an inclusive decarbonised transport solutions. So, so really looking at the um, potential solutions for those living in uh, more rural or dispersed communities and taking that challenge on head on. Um, uh, the, 
uh, a recommendation that the government really should utilise the evidence base being prepared by TFN and other subnational transport bodies, particularly as it looks to, um, to pursue its strategic priority around place-based solutions. Um, and, and finally, that the North is awarded an equitable share of any funding for the trialling and, and development of emerging technologies, which is, again, another strategic priority within their policy paper. Um, and as Lucy said, we, we've, uh, we've sort of tweaked the, the report uh, in, in the last few days to take into account the, um, the response from the environmental transport organisations. Um, so um, all of their recommendations are, are taken on board and integrated into the report, um, albeit we won't be at this stage proposing to include aviation and shipping within our own um, uh, with a, within our own target trajectory, um, although we do, um, we, we have emphasised the need for clear national strategy um, around that uh, aviation and shipping. Thank you, Peter, and uh, welcome uh, uh, to uh, Transport for the North, and, thank, and welcome to our committee meeting. So thank you for that uh, 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 clear presentation. Uh, Lucy, is there anything you wish to uh, add before I uh, open this up for, in the first place, any clarifications of the comprehensive paper that we've been provided with? Yeah, I think just to reiterate on um, the note that was circulated or will be circulated from the environmental kind of groups, um, in advance of that, actually, um, we've been kind of positively engaging with them over a number of months, actually. Um, and there was a previous note circulated um, about a month ago uh, outlining things that they would like TFN to kind of uh, include within our response. So there was additional points raised to the, to the note that Debbie's read out earlier. And um, so they have all been included, as Peter talked about. Um, and we have uh, committed to go back to those environmental groups on, on this issue around aviation and shipping, just to clarify why we're not including that, um, just, to, just to make sure that um, they understand TFN's position and, and where we've kind of included things and where we haven't, we've provided a clear explanation as to why. Thank you. Just an observation on my part uh, uh, before I open this up. Uh, then I, I get the impression from the way uh, Peter's just delivered uh, these headlines is that in actual fact you fully support uh, a sub, the sub-national transport bodies uh, actually getting a, 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 a statutory uh, involvement in this? Yes, yeah. I, I, I think essentially what we're trying to do in this response, because it isn't a formal consultation, is outline where we need clear national government policy through the Transport Decarbonisation Plan not published this year. And actually, where they'll give clear direction, whether it's to STBs or to local authorities in terms of what their role is within within this kind of functional policy framework. Yeah, no, I believe uh, that our work can very much support their objectives. So I, I, uh, I, I fully support that. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to open this up uh, in the first instance for any any uh, technical uh, any technical clarifications that people might have, and I can see there's a, a number of things that are in the chat. So let me just check with the chat. Um, uh, so, uh, Councillor Hughes, I, uh, I'd like to invite you uh, to ask your questions, please. Um, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Chair. I, 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 I presume that IAS is something to do with aviation and shipping, but I'd like clarification on that, please. And in the same paragraph in the letter, which is the fifth paragraph in the letter, first page, you've got PTE as well. I don't see any explanation elsewhere of that. So I've got some further questions, but I'll maybe start with just with those. Thanks. So TTE is total transport emissions. And I believe <laughs> I, IAS, I'll have to get the actual... Um, the full wording on it, um, but I think it's it's part of a, a, a calculation standard and an accounting standard. Uh, okay, well, Chair, I have asked for explanations of acronyms I, in the past. I realised that 
the um, the letter is a supplement, as it were, to the main papers. But it would be really very helpful if they could be provided, and it would save time at the meeting as well, if that could be the case. Thank you. So just to confirm on that, it's, it's, it is, as you suggest, um, international aviation and shipping. Thank you very Thank much, you. Peter. Uh, Neil, just before you move to your next questions, I'm just going to ask if there's anybody else got any, uh, any clarification uh, uh, questions at all before we move into sort of uh, effectively debating what's on the paper. Yeah, Chair Steve Parrish, uh, the only AIS I know is the tracking system for shipping you can look for any ship in the world and it'll tell you where it is at any one moment. Um, but I'm not, I mean, are we spending time on aviation and shipping? Because it doesn't really seem part of our core business, shall we say? Uh, no, it, it, it isn't, as I think Lucy explained that. And uh, the acronym, I think, was IAS rather than... Yeah, yeah. Is, IAS is an yeah. it's a global tracking system for shipping. Uh, well, Steve, you're a fountain of knowledge. Thank you. Which is how we know where that yacht was that Boris was supposed to be on. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Are there any other technical uh, questions we've already did, did perhaps debate and add any other points at all? OK, in which case I'll open this up to just general questions and comments. Uh, Neil, would you like to start, please? Um, yeah, uh, we, so three questions, four questions. Um, bottom of page 12, um, I, I wholly support the uh, suggestions of, of, uh, of, a, of an emphasis on the decarbonisation challenge in uh, rural areas specifically. Obviously, it's a challenge everywhere. But um, I wonder if, if some examples by TFN, for example, the East Lancashire link line between Cone and skipped and I mean I can think of others in my own area but trying to be impartial that's just a thought sorry Neil yes. you're, uh, you're, you're drifting in and out do you think you could just uh, see if there's something with your microphone or um, speak uh, directly well, into it uh, I'll just I'll just check that. I think my microphone's on. Yeah, we, we, we're uh, yeah. hearing you loud and clear now. That's much better. Thank you. Yeah, I was just um, leaving through my papers. Apologies for that. So page 24, um, there's a reference to place-based solutions. I think I know what this is, but I've only heard it in a different context. Indeed, this phrase keeps cropping up in government um, a promotion, um, uh, meaning different things over the years. So perhaps a brief officer explanation of that. That's page 24. On page 41, we have another acronym, which is SPOC. And page 88, I'm just finding that, Chair. Um, uh, so my final question for now. Um, yeah, the, and the, the TFN has a number of admirable strategies, but I wonder whose who's job it is to bring all these together in the eyes of government, because we still have a very centralised system of government, and I can't imagine um, our national government necessarily giving all its attention to one particular uh, uh, region, especially if it's a, a long way from Westminster, and I, I, I presume this is with the chief executive's role, but I would like an assurance that the different TFN initiatives are being, if you like, homogenised um, when they're brought before um, the Department for Transport and, and the Minister. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, Peter, would you like to take those questions, or is it Lucy? I'm not sure which. Uh, if I may, Chair, D David Hughes, uh, just to come in on, 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 on that last point. Yeah, I mean... Uh, Oh, thank course, you, David. We, you know, t talking for Barry as, as, as chief exec, of course, we try to ensure that um, we do bring together the various strands of our work into a um, into a coherent uh, conversation um, with government, uh, 
obviously we have we have discussions with them at, at program level on a number of issues, but we also uh, on a regular basis at least at least every month we, we sit down with with the FT officials uh, and on an ad hoc, ad hoc basis um, John and Barry will, will will meet with ministers to to, to, uh, to give an overview of, of, of the totality of, of TFN's work because clearly it's important that we do bring together all of the strands. So I just wanted to cover that that, that last point that was raised. Thank you, David. On the uh, place-based solutions uh, question, um, this uh, this is really around one of the strategic priorities that are highlighted. It's, it's actually highlighted within DFT's policy paper, um, and it's the realization that one one size doesn't fit all, um, and that different areas will have different um, carbon footprints and different different uh, different challenges in decarbonizing. And so there's a need to understand that. Um, so that's that's really what it means by place based solutions is that um, there will be a mixture of measures um, which filter down from probably national levers, but that are interpreted in in local ways. I believe there's a, a question on um, uh, an abbreviation. Was it SPOC? Yeah. I, I, are you able to give me the paragraph number? Because I can't actually find that, and I don't, <laughs> don't know what, what, what it actually yeah, is. Yeah, well, in my notes, it's 41. But I'll, it's, um, yeah, it's the, it's the, the third substantial paragraph on page 41 in the, it's the, in the internal briefing notes. But ah. it's, in, it's in the amongst the papers here. Okay. Um, just bear with me. I'm just trying to find. So interventions developed by TFN were identified by the investment program, the SPOC, little uh, s, so plural, yeah. prepared to date for the SDCs. OK, sorry, I can see this now. Yeah. So uh, essentially what um, what you're seeing here on page 41 onwards is part of the evidence that we're going to submit to DFT alongside our submissions. So part of this is about sharing with them um, the work TFN's been doing and actually kind of this, this thinking where it's talking about the SPOC, small c, the SPOC, um, that's uh, an acronym that um, TFN has used to support the strategic development corridors, which is the acronym the SDCs. So the SPOX is the strategic pro program outline case, I think is 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 the, the what the acronym stands for. And that's a kind of TFN um, internal acronym. Sorry, I wasn't I wasn't aware that these uh, supporting documents have been shared as well. Thank Thanks all, all for those answers. Very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, uh, are there any other uh, comments or questions on this particular paper at all? Just while you're thinking, I've got uh, a couple of uh, things that I'd like to just ask. Um, I very much welcome the fact that it's uh, a, a very much a place-based focus, uh, uh, sort of uh, living in North Yorkshire where uh, we are told that only, I think, less than 3% of the population use the trains. In actual fact, less than 3% have access to the trains, therefore, it's not really, it's a bit of a spurious argument. Um, so we do need alternatives and it's highly likely, I suppose it'll be the bus um, and maybe hydrogen powered uh, buses. So uh, I very much support this place based, uh, the no, well, effectively, no, uh, no one solution fits all. And I think we've got to be very much conscious of that. So I would very much support that. Uh, and uh, uh, in in your evidence, uh, I don't know if you de uh, detail precisely that I think there's 7,000 miles of road in uh, in North Yorkshire, but it's certainly quite a lot of road. Uh, so I'd like to thank you for that piece. Uh, the other piece that I'm really interested in is I do like this point about the subnational transport body really becoming uh, a statutory partner in this, uh, in particular. Uh, I actually think that supports our case for transport for the north. 
in terms of um, uh, when it comes to uh, bidding for funding, uh, in that we are very much we are very much part and parcel of the solution and not the problem. And, and it, uh, we already in the previous meetings have put into the KPIs uh, for transport for the north uh, that uh, climate uh, change and uh, climate change mitigation in terms of uh, not just making uh, roads more robust or railway lines more robust, but actually, uh, actually about the fact that we're moving people from one mode of transport uh, to another. So that's therefore promoting the decarbonisation programme, as well as the fact that we're trying to change the technology. So if we move people from cars to trains, then that will be a saving. If we then move the trains from, let's say, diesel to electric or diesel to hydrogen, then again, we're creating more savings. So, so actually, I think it fits with the strategy. And I think there's an argument that says uh, the subnational transport body, uh, that statutory involvement then formalizes this link where effectively we are enabling um, we're enabling that and we are building it in as to part of the, the strategy to under we're therefore underpinning and supporting the government whilst we're also achieving the goal of improving our transport infrastructure. Uh, so I don't expect to comment back on that but uh, I'd like to bring in uh, uh, Councillor Salter if I may please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I, I would say I did think this uh, report was um, fascinating. Uh, I thought it was uh, really interesting and particularly in its consideration of some of the sort of future possibilities and technologies that may become available um, as we look to decarbonise. So uh, considering uh, particularly mentions of uh, hydrogen vehicles, uh, mobility as a service, a uh, brief mention of driverless cars, I'm interested uh, in sort of knowing to what extent um, Transport for the North feel that we need central government to be taking the lead on uh, these sorts of developing technologies and to what extent Transport for the North and obviously our, our constituent local uh, councils can crack on and uh, sort of start in, in encouraging uh, these sorts of opportunities for decarbonisation uh, as these technologies uh, become available. I'm also interested, uh, given uh, sort of difficulties that we've previously discussed with relation to integrated smart ticketing, uh, how optimistic uh, Transport for the North are about mobility as a service and what perhaps uh, central government may need to do to ensure that that uh, is, is a viable uh, possibility. Oh, over to you, Peter. Thank you. Oh. So there, there's some quite big questions there. Um, so I'll, I'll try and give some, some uh, qu quick answers, but it, it's possibly something we can reply more fully on if, if, if needed. Um, so... I think the first question is around the sort of role for, for what role do we envisage national government having to play and, and to what extent can we crack on? Um, I think uh, there will be a role for national government in, and it, depending on what aspect we're looking at, it will be greater or, or, or less. Certainly when it comes to um, setting a tone on demand management and also um, setting a, uh, a phase in and phase out dates. So phase out dates for um, petrol, um, diesel and hybrid vehicles and phase in of EV or, or hydrogen vehicles. Those are, those are sort of things that we see being set at a, at a national level. Um, but there are aspects around both of those, for example, where we can we certainly see a role for um, TFN and uh, a, a sort of an implementation role at local authority level. So, for example, um, for uh, road user charging, um, it's quite highly likely, if, depending on what target trajectory we would take, that we would need to um, look at forms of road user charging for different types of road. Um, and some of that will be within the local authorities' powers. 
Um, and, and similarly, um, we need to understand in terms of uh, electric vehicles, um, what, what is the solution for the north? How do we travel? Um, we don't all travel within our local authority boundaries. Um, quite often, talking about North Yorkshire, a lot of people travel to work up and, you know, on the Tees. So um, there, there, there is a role there for, um, I, I see, for the TFN in terms of gaining a consensus on where we want to be in terms of um, electric vehicles and then what that means at a local level to, to implement that. And it's really, really important that we get things like interoperability in, in the physical um, charging network between um, different areas of the north, that we get interoperability in terms of data and also in terms of literal charging, as in how do we actually pay for that charging. So, so you can see it's quite a complex tapestry. There's no, there's no uh, strong real answer there. I think where we can start to move on quicker will be around um, encouraging modal shift. So obviously demand management has a role to play in that, but um, encouraging modal shift uh, onto active modes um, and onto public transport will be, will be an area where we'd look to move quicker, for, or, or as they say, further and faster. Um, and uh, I think there was another question about uh, how op optimistic we were around mass. Um, so uh, mobility as a service. Um, I think that uh, mass will have an important part to play. Um, the extent, I, I think the real question is, is sort of puzzling, not just us, but at a national level, is how we um, decarbonise transport in, in more rural areas. And there are questions about how mass could play a role there and, and some of the pitfalls associated with, with mass when in more rural areas you have less choice of providers. Um, so I think we are optimistic about mass, particularly in, in more urban setups and semi-urban setups, um, but we're very aware of the potential issues around it in, in more rural areas. And if I could just come in on, on uh, again to address that point around math, and I think a really valid point that you made around the lessons we've learned through the IST program at TFN and some of the um, issues we've had in implementing some of that. Um, I think that is definitely kind of a key lesson and a key message that we've tried to draw out within the response to DFT. So uh, included in para 4.3, I think, uh, which is page 25 of your papers, where we've tried to really, um, really uh, make that point quite clear around um, the lessons we've learned as part of the IST programme. And actually, one of the core issues, particularly that we faced in terms of IST was you know, uh, private sector operators not wanting to kind of share their data, which would enable kind of mass technologies as part of that. And, and clearly we understand there was a lot of complexity to that and um, some concerns around um, commercial sensitivities. So one of the key messages, again, that we've drawn out within the response and we think is the role of government to kind of help address this moving forward is around clearer regulation. Um, so that's definitely a national policy lever. It's not a lever that sits at the local level. So it, it's something that we would expect DFT through this transport decarbonisation plan to really um, kind of set some clear regulations around this, both for um, the top and whether it's bus operators or private sectors, some clear kind of uh, sort of mandates around how they would be expected to share data moving forward. Um, and that can only really be driven by, by regulation to kind of almost enforce that. Without that, um, it makes it very challenging and, and the issues that we face in the IST programme, you know, may continue to occur. So a really valid point, and we have tried to kind of draw that out and address that. And hopefully DFT will, will also learn some lessons as we have around, um, you know, what else needs to be done in that space. Thank you very much, Lucy. Is that uh, sufficient for you, Matthew? Uh, thank you very much. Yes, that, that was uh, very helpful. 
Okay, I'm going to just uh, allow uh, Neil to uh, add some comments, then I will add some closing comments, and then we'll summarize uh, the review, unless anybody puts anything rapidly in the chat, because I do need to move us along slightly. So, uh, uh, Councillor Hughes, if you'd like to add your yeah. other additional comments, that would be yeah. great. Thanks, Chair. I'll actually, I, I do endorse your comments on buses. We do need to promote and extend the national bus network. And um, I'm happy to cite North Yorkshire, the bit nearest to, to me, as a great example, with the example of the Little White Bus and Dales Bus, provide an excellent service. But as I'm sure you will be aware, franchising, although the model is a good one, is not so straightforward in rural areas, as the papers talk about franchising, simply owing to the limited capacity of, of providers. So the paper does need to bear that in mind. Road charging, yes, I think we do have to bite the bullet and go ahead with this. And, and it needs to refer to some very popular rural parts of the country as well, such as the Lake District where I live. But it's important to emphasise absolutely there needs to be full consultation well before any referendum on any specific road charging scheme so that the public understand the principle and clearly there need to be exceptions for low income, for local residents in some cases, and so on. And, and also there needs to be fully adequate public transport in place before any road charging scheme is introduced. Um, the, um, um, I, I just wanted to flag up, there's a section on page 36 about um, strengthening our ports. And I couldn't be representing Cumbria without mentioning, mentioning the potential for the port of Workington which Cumbria County Council is certainly trying to develop access to at present. Um, so there's that. And finally, there's also a reference to elected mayors on page 107. It must be in one of the appendices. And whilst we know the government is in favour of this, not all local authorities, either unitary or two-tier, necessarily are. And in fact, Cumbria is, you might be aware, is currently negotiating um, for a possible unity system which doesn't necessarily have an elected mayor. We see the outcome in due course, but I don't want TFN to feel there is unequivocal support around the country or even around the north for this concept. Each area, I think, needs to have its own solutions negotiated locally with the government. Thanks, thanks for that. Uh, do you expect any, any, any comments on that at all, Neil, or are you, are, are you just putting those forward as comments? No, they, they were just comments, really, but I hope officers will, with your endorsement, take, um, take the principal com ones on board anyway. Thank you. Now, I'll summarise our points in a moment. Uh, so I just had a couple of points. First of all, um, I was reading a book recently, um, and um, I read two forecasts about, um, about transport in the coming years. The first one is that by 2050, uh, uh, nobody will be allowed to drive on our roads because it'll be too dangerous because everything will be do driven by automated uh, vehicles and they will react much faster than humans. And that uh, by the mid 2030s, the, the, um, the, uh, the majority of car, uh, car ownership will start to disappear. Uh, so obviously those uh, those both are by Naveen Jain, and please feel free to have a look at his forecasts. But they're clearly coming. Okay, he he, he lives in America, but uh, there is um, there is obviously uh, changes very much in how cars are going to be driven, and that sort of takes me on to a couple of points I'd just like to add. Um, one of the things that's going to be critical, and you'd mentioned um, act, um, active travel, is actually the transition points. So where you change from one, uh, one type of travel to another. So if you get to a train station, you might want to cycle home. So how, where is the bike kept? Or at the moment, we've got a lot of car parks, but is there a bike rack in there? So again, it's how do we do those transition points? Uh, and the, the other side of it is how do we carry bikes be, by any public or, or public transport in order to aid that last mile at both ends or that first mile and that last mile of any of any journey. So I'd like you to think about those things. Um, and then the other thing that I think is very critical here and might well support our argument as well is um, is actually freight. At the moment, we know 90 percent of our freight goes by road. Well, you know, if we can if we can start to move some of that, then that will obviously 
start to reduce congestion um, uh, as well. So that 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 is important I, I, a consideration I believe for you to include. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to just try and uh, summarise. Um, I'm just, I, let me just. W I'm just watching the chat. That's fine. Um, I'd just like to summarise what we've come up with uh, and just make sure that all the members uh, agree with that. The first one is that we very much support that our subnational transport body, i.e. TFN in this case, uh, becomes a, stra uh, a statutory um, partner in this particular strategy uh, for decarbonisation. Uh, uh, we have an argument that says it supports the KPIs of transport for the north. Um, so we therefore become part of the solution uh, to the decarbonisation. Um, one of the key things is that we are responsible for trying to move people from one, one transport mode to another and even to active transport, which effectively is walking or on their bike. Um, uh, and th we also very much support um, uh, the fact that no, no one solution fits all and we very much have a very uh, uh, dispersed area and therefore uh, trains will not be the right solution uh, for most of the majority of say somewhere like North Yorkshire or Cumbria but maybe it's cars uh, which are either fueled by electricity or by hydrogen. Uh, and I believe we have strong sources of hydrogen c uh, coming on stream. That is green hydrogen. Chair, can I just interject briefly? We, we need to be aware, and I think officers are aware of the fact that electric vehicles are not, as, are not an all-out solution because they also have the capacity to cause congestion in the same way that petrol and diesel vehicles do. So that, the, the, the response needs to take account of that. Yeah, I know. Uh, I, that's and and, my, and that actually fits with the uh, last two points. One was obviously the development of ports, and this again could help freight. So if it's going by, if, if it's get, it's getting to a closest point that way. And the final point that I think was made was about uh, bus franchises and uh, and how that uh, how that um, franchise situation will work within this area in order for it to be. Uh, I use the word loosely profitable, but in, uh, but affordable for that to be uh, that that mode of uh, that mode of uh, transport, that public transport to be available. Are there any points I've missed, uh, fellow councillors? Yeah. If not, so oh yes, sorry, is that you, uh, yeah, sure. Councillor Chater? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Just a thought, we mentioned previously about um, the electrification of the line between, uh, between Selby and Hull. There was also some mention made of um, using the rail lines for um, carrying more freight, because one of the things you just said earlier in the comments is that vast amounts of our freight is going by road. One of the things that each riding council has been exploring with other partners is reactivating rail lines such as the one from Bridlington to York. Now, if we were able to get something done around those and use that for carrying freight as well, that might reduce the amount of levels by carrying more goods direct from the port of Hull up that line, which gives it additional capacity, takes it off the roads, and then puts it onto the East Coast main line in the York area, which is then eliminating part of the problems that we've already got um, in the whole of the areas around Yorkshire. And, but that also then applies to other disused lines in other parts of the country. Those lines themselves can be used to deliver the objectives of reducing carbon by getting more stuff that's coming direct from the ports onto those lines by connecting the lines back to um, lines that are either completely disused or reduced usage, such as the um, Hull to Scarborough connecting back to York and going that way. But the but the spend on doing York to Brit to Beverly would be a, an effective way of delivering that and making sure A, you improve the connectivity for um, public transport to get people from A to B, but B, for getting freight off the roads and into that. I just suggest that's something that might wish to be considered because this has only occurred in the last few weeks that this has been brought forward where each riding council 
have put additional money in to support the Department for Transport on the, um, the opportunity, exploring the opportunities for that work to be done. Thank you, Sean. Consider that noted. Um, uh, could I just ask Gary? Did I uh, did I did I miss anything on the uh, on on my recounting of that summary? Um, I'm not aware that he did chair now. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, does anybody else have any comments to make before we move on to the next item? Uh, on, and, and, in, and in particular, are we agreed that those are items that we would uh, like Peter and Lucy to consider? I'm taking that as a yes, so I'd like to now move on to the integrated rail plan, which uh, I believe will be led by uh, David Hughes. Is that correct? Actually, Chair, I'm going to invite, if it's OK, uh, my colleague Tim Foster to speak to this item. No, uh, that's uh, a delight. Just before, I've just realised I missed the notes. Uh, on the last item, Gary, could you also make a formal note in the minutes that we'd like to thank Mr Ray and his team at uh, the ETO uh, for their submission? Thank you, Gary. So, Tim, over yeah, to you. Yes, that's been noted, Chair. Yeah, Tim, over to you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, the, uh, I think, as, as members will uh, will know, the government uh, announced following the Oakley review that it intended to uh, develop an integrated rail plan for the Midlands and the North, um, looking at how best to integrate Northern Pass Rail, HS2, and other major rail schemes. Um, so it's, it's, it's work that's been led by government. It's been informed by work that the National Infrastructure Commission are doing. Um, on a rail needs assessment, looking looking very much at the strategic opportunities and the economic benefits of um, of integrating these two major schemes and looking at options for how best to deliver them. The the, the work that we've set out in detail in the paper that I'll um, uh, I'll take largely as read um, is is helping TFN members um, uh, get to the point where we can both kind of feed in proposals into the NIC's work, but also respond to um, the uh, the outcome of the integrated rail plan process. Um, the, uh, the detail of the government's um, work on the IRP is, is relatively high level at this stage. They remain committed to producing an integrated rail plan by the end of the year. Uh, we know that the, the National Infrastructure Commission have um, uh, 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 produce one interim report um, I can touch on briefly later um, but are intending to advise government on the options uh, by late autumn probably in November so, so time is relatively tight um, we've done a lot of work particularly with rail officers across the north to bring together all uh, kind of regional priorities um, and as the paper sets out start to frame those in terms of early opportunities to, to bring forward rail schemes, building on the work that we've already done around the economic recovery plan, uh, but starting to look in some detail at um, how best to uh, find opportunities to integrate um, NPR, HS2 uh, and, and Transpan and Upgrade uh, in the north of England, alongside um, all of the priorities for, for improving the conventional network so that we end up with a sequence program of work over the next 20 to 25 years that then delivers the the, the end vision for rail in the north as set out in the long-term rail strategy uh, for TFN. So that's the work that's progressing on at the moment, progressing really well. It's work in progress. I think this is an opportunity to take stock of um, kind of where we are in the process and, and some of the challenges and um, uh, at risks as well as the opportunities that come from uh, getting to TFN's own view of the of the integrated rail plan. Uh, Chair, I'll, I'll I'll leave it there, given that time is short, and um, pick up questions or or comments. Okay, uh, my understanding, Tim, is that you want us to, uh, as a committee, to note the progress to date and the emerging conclusions. Uh, and we need to agree these uh, and that you uh, we obviously need to give you any comments because you want to get these uh, proposals agreed at the board in September. Is that correct? Yes, please. Now, final proposals won't. Uh, for, and there's a, there's a I know there's an NPR discussion later on the agenda. Final proposals into the National Infrastructure Commission will await outstanding decisions on. 
on NPR, but at this point we're trying to put a uh, an interim response into the Infrastructure Commission, certainly towards the end of September, uh, if not early October, to make sure that we're influencing them in good time. Thank you very much, Tim. I'll open this up to questions, and I already have uh, two questions. So, uh, if I could ask um, uh, Neil to ask his question, please, that would be perfect. Yeah, just uh, thanks, Chair. Just wanted some clarification on the Crew North and Goulburn issues. I hope that's not asking for too much detail. Only a brief answer will suffice. These are referred to on pages 120, 121, and I imagine these um, uh, these relate to HS. Two, but just some clarification of what what the issues involved are, please. Thank you. Yep. So really, really, the the, the issue with uh, the Goldborn link is is how best to connect from HS2 on to ensure connectivity onto the north uh, west and onto Scotland via Glasgow. Um, and, and I think there's been a very strong representation, particularly from from Cumbria and Lancashire, about the importance of at that connectivity, there have uh, government themselves have raised some questions about the goal, the viability of the Goldborn link. But but our 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 latest understanding is that's still firmly within HS2's plans, uh, and we think it's very important. If for any reason the Goldborn link didn't happen, then you would have to do much more to upgrade and improve the West Coast Main Line. So um, uh, that plus the Crew North connection is um, this is where I get. Uh, this is where I probably may exceed my technical limits, but it's again that's about connectivity from 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 NPR as it reaches crew to enable the connectivity then on to uh, uh, to towards Liverpool City region and and out towards um, uh, connectivity into Wales as well. So strategically, economically, really important, um, uh, and sort of sit on the on the border between HS2 and NPR. So, so it's really important that, not, that that don't get lost in between the two, if that makes sense. Yeah. That's very helpful, Tim. Thank you very much. Uh, I have uh, Councillor Cooper now, if you would like to come in, Councillor Cooper. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, I can't uh, type messages into the chat. The, uh, the chat's disabled for me today for some reason, so I'll just put my hand up. I hope you don't mind. Um, just on the, um, I've, I've got a question of my own, but just on the previous point about the Crew North connection, that's the bit that runs from from Crew through uh, Winsford, Middlewich, Northwich, and then and then on to um, uh, Lim. Uh, I, I know this because it runs adjacent to my ward, um, and uh, one of the big one of the big problems uh, that um, HS2 have had with that is that in the first version of the route they had it going across an underground gas storage facility which they didn't know about so then they shifted the route to the left and now it's going over a, a disused salt mine and an, an area of subsidence where there's a, a load of collapsed canals so Balfour Beatty are currently doing uh, quite a lot of work looking at the ground conditions in that area and I imagine there'll be route revisions follow, following all that. Uh, my question also relates to um, page 120 where, where it, it mentions in paragraph 4.6 development of the Castlefield corridor is an urgent agreed priority for the TFM board and other local schemes which can urgently alleviate capacity constraints for the wider network. I was just wondering whether you already had a list of local schemes in mind for alleviating the Castlefield corridor or is that still work to be done? Uh, it's working, the Castlefield corridor specifically is work in progress so there's um there's a lot of work ongoing. Well, a, a lot of the options are long-standing, um, uh, but there's uh, there's a there's a working group which is now urgently working through um, uh, the options and deciding the way forward. I think I think Castlefield is it, it's what it feels like one of the the areas where everybody has coalesced around. It, it's the critical it's a critical part of the network, not just for Manchester, but as we know, um, in terms of relieving capacity across the north. And, and needs urgent attention. Um, uh, but our strategic rail colleagues are, are dealing with the specifics of that at this point. Thank you. Do you know? Do you know if the Manchester Airport Western Link is on the is on the list for for that to divert uh, North Wales and Liverpool bound traffic to the airport away from Castlefield into the south? I will need to confirm that and come back to you separately. But it's quite a quick thing to, for us to confirm. Thank you. Uh, Chair, you're on mute again. Yeah, Councillor Chater, uh, welcome. Uh, I expected you to be on this one.
Councillor Chater, you're on mute, I'm afraid. Uh, Sean, have we got, have we got uh, yeah, there we go. Lovely. Yeah, that's, um, the thing that's that I'm concerned about um, is that when government were making pronouncements about um, development of rail in the north, amazingly, we had the announcements that we'd have all expected around the Pennines area, but also to the north. But suddenly there was no mention again of the east, east of um, York, east of Selby. It affects obviously a lot of areas. Mm. But the concern is that if we're trying to deal with um, getting people onto rail, we need to look at the whole Humber sub-region, and then we need to look at North Yorkshire, because clearly we want to be getting yeah. people to be using trains more effectively, but also using the rail network to get freight in large quantities away from the ports. The Humber is one of the busiest areas for shipping, as you all know, but the more goods we can get shifted onto rail from Hull, from Grimsby, from Immingham and from Goole, that's absolutely vital and yeah. we need to make sure that this is emphasised in the strategic plans that are going forward. It's great to look at the Trans Pennine but some of the Trans Pennine doesn't, well it doesn't help those in the East Riding at Goole which Goole's expected to be one of the major manufacturing centres for, um, for train manufacture. That's not necessarily a part of the area that's going to be boosted by the works and I do think this needs to be reflected in where we're going and I'd ask that that be considered at this stage because well we want to make sure that we can get as many people and as much goods as possible onto rail. Thank you Chair. Uh, very powerful points there, uh, thank you Sean. Uh, I now have uh, Councillor Parrish. Yes, Chair. Uh, just oh. Just responding to uh, a couple of items that have just been mentioned. Uh, first, the Castlefield corridor, and um, I'm not quite sure where we're up to with that. I know the government pulled the plug on it, said it wasn't worth it. Uh, so I'm just wondering, you know, what's in the public domain from TFN or anybody else about the, uh, the, the benefits of that? Because obviously, as far as I know, the only major thing there was two extra platforms at Piccadilly. Um, but it still leaves you with, you know, a tight, the same number of trains coming across the viaduct. So I'd be interested to know whether there's any uh, anything else planned for that other than the extra platforms at Piccadilly. Uh, and somebody did mention the Airport Western Link. Um, I'd have to record a personal view. I don't think Warrington's got a view on this, but uh, I, I, th I'm, I think it's got a fairly poor business case. And uh, I'm on the Manchester Airport Consultative Committee. And uh, I know they don't relish the idea of tunnelling under both runways to do it. Thank you. Are you, are you expecting a response from Tim? Um, on the Manchester, on the Castlefield Corridor one, yes, perhaps. Yes. If there's anything other than extra platforms at Piccadilly. Yeah. I mean, that, I think rather than me dealing with Castlefield corridor here because I'm I'm not up to date with the latest discussions but um, uh, there was a paper at a, a, a TIF and board I think at the start of the year uh, which was taken in public um, uh, and so is publicly available which sets out the various options for Castlefield which are, as well as the additional platforms are uh, at Piccadilly um, which which TIF and has supported publicly um, uh, there's a range of other kind of capacity uh, and service considerations um, that are being considered okay. at the moment. Uh, I think that the public facing paper sets all of that out. Okay, thank you. The uh, but, but there is a local issue for Warrington because uh, they were using the Castlefield corridor problems as a reason not to give us the three trains an hour they promised at Warrington West in the yeah. franchise. And the, the late the new timetable from the autumn, uh, they've actually scuppered it properly because they've got this bright idea. You don't, it's a local service, but the local service out of Liverpool follows the uh, express to the airport. And from September, they're going to bring the local out first, shunt it to the slow lines at Edge Hill and then back at Parkway, which creates two conflicting movements with trains going in the opposite direction. Uh, and they think that's a bright idea. So I'm, I'm arguing that 
they've not modelled that one right, but that has an impact as well on you know trains going into the Castlefield corridor from from the central central um, Cheshire Lines line. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Parish. Does anybody else have any uh, questions, comments um, uh, for uh, Tim at all? In which case. Um, we, uh, as a committee, note uh, the progress. We hope that you've taken notes of some of the comments. Uh, I'm, particularly, um, I, I'm particularly aware uh, of the, um, the, the, the view around the Humber. I do think that that is critical, uh, and I do share uh, part of the committee's concern that, um, that actually we're too, we are looking at the middle of the country and perhaps the west of the country. Uh, and that sometimes we don't always take into account what I, I'm not calling the Far East, but it, but Hull does seem an awful long way from uh, from where, from once you go past Leeds, it does seem a long way, and it can uh, uh, and I'm sure it's not easily forgotten. No, not at all. Just to give you some assurance, so I didn't respond on that. Yeah, all all of those areas and priorities are firmly in our thinking. We we picked a lot of that up from responses that were made to the Infrastructure Commission in May. Uh, from East Riding Council um, and others, uh, and and we think there are lots of opportunities for for early acceleration of freight opportunities. So we'll be both reflecting that in in the integrated rail plan submission, um, but also in the work that Lucy Hudson, who I think spoke to the committee last time, is now doing on TFN's more detailed freight strategy. So so you'll see much more around all of those activities, I think, in the coming months. Thank you, Tim. OK, I'm going to move us on to item seven now. Item seven is any business which the chair is satisfied is urgent. And I, again, I have to apologise to you. You got these documents a bit later uh, than the, the standard pack. However, uh, I do believe uh, that this is well, uh, my official wording is I am satisfied that this should be reviewed by the scrutiny committee uh, as final comments need to be submitted about this, uh, this particular item. Uh, by Friday. So it's actually looking at the comprehensive spending review. Um, I do appreciate that a draft submission has already been sent in, but we do have time to add comments. So I would like us to, uh, uh, to, to look at this particular item. And uh, I believe this will probably be David um, or, or Ian presenting this. I'm not sure which. Uh, I'm happy to um, uh, present, Chair. Um, I think Ian's had a few technical difficulties this morning. Um, so the, the paper um, sets out, uh, summarises the uh, approach we're taking to this initial part of the uh, spending review. Um, again, yeah, apologies uh, for the late circulation of the papers. Um, uh, something that we've been working on um, over the uh, last few days and been discussing uh, the approach uh, with officials at the department. Um, the Department have asked for an, an initial submission uh, from TFN uh, by uh, close of uh, this coming Friday. Um, I'd stress that this is, a, an, um, and this is very much reflected in the discussions we've had with officials at the department, this is an initial um, submission uh, to the department in terms of our funding requirements. Um, and we've focused at this stage on the core funding requirements of TFN uh, and, and also our core programmes of IST uh, and NPR. Um, we anticipate that we may want to make broader representations at a later stage in the spending review uh, uh, around the North's uh, ambitions and, and issues such as the transport charter, the economic recovery plan, etc. Uh, but that's not the focus at this stage in the process. As I say, the, the focus at this stage is on what we're calling our core funding requirements. Um, as the paper um, explains, um, we are um, seeking to arrange a meeting with the Secretary of State over the coming uh, short number of weeks, we hope, hopefully within the next week. So we've had a positive response in the last day or so from his private office, actually from the Secretary of State himself, uh, a letter back um, to, to Barry saying he would welcome uh, a meeting of, of the kind that's, that, that's alluded to in the paper that you have before you. Um, and this, the, the proposed meeting very much follows the um, discussion that was had at the last uh, partnership board at the end of July. So the intent is that the, the chair of the board, John Cridland, with, with Barry, assuming he, he's back, 
uh, and and um, a delegation of, of uh, TFM board members would meet with the Secretary of State to have a, um, a discussion about uh, the intent uh, behind the announcement of the Northern Transport Acceleration Council uh, and, and explore in a bit more detail what its purpose and, and remit will be and, of course, what the implications of that might be for the future role and remit of transport for the North itself. Um, we're hoping that that meeting with the Secretary of State will, will take place before the next meeting of the TFM board, which is, uh, I think, 17th of September uh, from memory, so that we can um, report back to the TFM board the outcomes of, of that discussion with the Secretary of State. Um, and we would still have the opportunity after the September TFM board to make further representations to government uh, in the context of the spending review. Um, as our understanding from um, uh, officials is that the, the, the kind of cutoff point for any further representations isn't actually until the end of September. Um, so that's kind of broadly where we are, and, and the paper just tries to, 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 to kind of set out um, uh, the, the approach that we're taking. As I say, very much the focus on the moment at the moment is on the kind of core funding requirements. Um, if Ian has not managed to overcome his technical challenges and, and join the call. Oh, no, he's there. I can see he's there. Because what I was about to say is if there, if there are questions on the detail of some of the financial information uh, in the paper, then they're probably questions that Ian's best place to handle if there are any kind of comments on that overall approach uh, to the spending review that, that, that I've just described, then, then I'm happy to, to, to field those. So that's pretty much all I wanted to say by way of introduction, Chair. Thank you. Okay, David, thank you very much and welcome, Ian. Uh, we already have uh, some questions in the uh, chat box, so I'd like to bring in Councillor Hughes. Uh, if you would like to ask your uh, clarifications, that would be perfect. Um, yeah, thanks, Chair. Just for all the two acronyms um, on page 151 in para 3.7, the I and E account, and on page 152 in the first paragraph of 3.12, EMV bank cards. It's probably not necessary for us to know what it stands for, but it still will be useful. And would you like me to put my substantive questions at the same time? Sorry, yeah. I, I'm just having... Yes, yeah, please do. Um, right, okay. Well, actually, this, this, this paper should give us all cause for, for, for cause and concern I think, because first of all, is, is there not like, I mean, I'm not expecting you to have the answers, is there not likely to be some kind of bonfire of the quangos in the relatively near future, um, given the huge extra expense on tackling coronavirus and the enormous debt that the, the government has, I'm not making a, a political point, I'm, it, this is simply, a, I think, a reasonable question to ask. So is it not, in fact, highly likely that funding for regional transport bodies will contract rather than expand. Obviously, we would hope that's not the case. Um, indeed, is there not the possibility of, of abolition of regional transport bodies, um, given, as I previously stressed, the centralization agenda, no sign of that relenting, and, and so on. And then questions in, in, uh, on page one, 148. Um, there seems to be some contradiction, possibly, between paragraphs 2.2 and 2.4. Um, 2.2 suggests to me that only core funding for TFN is being sought in the submission to the CSR. But we all know that, and the paper states, that there's a lot more that TFN does. And paragraph 2.4 does need to, does, does suggest that these, the costs of all the other programs that uh, the Charter, the Economic Recovery Plan, uh, NPR and so on, ought also to be included. So I'd like obviously to, to try and reconcile the methodology suggested in 2.2 and 2.4, please. Thank you. Okay, just, Ian, just before you yeah. answer some of that, what I'd like to really say, and because I, I don't think you are in a position to be able to answer it, is um, we do not know uh, whether uh, how COVID will, ex, uh, ex, uh, um, will influence spending uh, and equally we don't know what else might happen to this particular body. But I do think that, we, that what we need to focus on is the jobs that we have in hand and that we know we have to do. And it's quite critical that we get this comprehensive spending review 
uh, in by Friday. So therefore, I would be asking you and, to just, uh, and members to focus on not necessarily the political, but what the content needs to be in this report in order to support uh, Ian and the team, if that's OK, please. So, Ian, over to you for the questions. I'll, I'll maybe pick up the first two and then maybe let David speak to the third one. Um, just in terms of acronyms, I and E is Income and Expenditure Account. Um, uh, EMV, e EMV is a Europe Mastercard and Visa. It's a it's the description for the system of, of um, bank card processing. Um, in terms of in terms of the question you asked in in relation to um, the the general situation, I think what we are trying to do within this is. Uh, CSR submission is at the same time as we as we make the case for the specific funding by doing that we are making the case for transport for the north now we are we were set up only two years ago um, we've we've done what we were were asked to do and I think if you think back to what drove northern leaders to to um, to push for a body like transport for the north in the first place back in 2015 I think the underlying drivers in terms of the need for transformational economic growth, the need for a, a sustainable and, and, and equitable economy, the, um, the need to use transport to facilitate those um, achieving those objectives is, if anything, more pronounced with COVID-19 rather than rather than removed by COVID-19. And actually what we are set up to do very much plays into what I think is you know, is now the the levelling up agenda, but has has been called called you know the, the, that basic policy principle of trying to rebalance the economy or or, or close the north south divide or what, or how it's been described over over the decades. Um, that that is still there, and we we play into that. So, I think I think you're, you're you're there is clearly a challenge around levels of funding, and that's partly what what the case we've got to argue is that the that, that funding transport for the north. To do the work and, and, and discharge its statutory functions um, is a useful way of, of spending government money, and, and that is what the CSR um, paper will do, um, or hopefully will do. Um, David, do you want to do you want to pick up on the on the last one? Um, I, I, yeah, thanks, Ian. I, I mean, I think I, I don't see a contradiction in, in what we set out in, in in that section too. I mean. It's a it's a it's a question of phasing of, of of our approaches to government. So the you know the moment in this first submission to the department, uh, the focus is as I say on, on core funding requirements. We then anticipate a discussion with the Secretary of State around Northern Transport Acceleration Council to pick up Councillor Parish's uh, query in the in the chat function. So we, we anticipate you know discussing that with the Secretary of State. And, 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 and that, you know, inevitably, would be, we think would become a broader discussion with the Secretary of State about what the delivery vehicles might be for investment in the north. Because I think when we talk about um, uh, the, the fiscal situation and investment in the north, there, there are two issues, really. There's what's the overall level of funding that's going to come into the north and then what's the role of TFN in that? Um, and, and really, I think what we're looking for from, from government is is, is uh, is, is, is some sense of, of, of where they see TFN in, in, in delivering the, uh, the investment envisaged in, in the levelling up agenda. So at this point, we focus on core requirement, core funding requirements. We then anticipate a discussion with the Secretary of State. Uh, and then I think we, we take stock. Uh, we, we discuss with the TFN board in September what broader representations we want to make in light of the discussion that we've had with the Secretary of State. So it's a kind of tactical thing, sequencing thing that we're, that we're trying to do. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, Are there a, any more uh, questions on this particular uh, item? Uh, I see, um, Councillor Parrish, you've yeah, indicated. It's just, uh, I mean, this Northern Transport Acceleration Council seemed to come out of the blue. Andy Burnham welcomed it, and I wondered if he knew more about it than the rest of us. Well, it just so, good. I mean, uh, being on a, a number of calls with, with, uh, uh, Andy Burnham and with uh, other members of of the board, um, and I think Andy Andy said at the partnership board at the end of July, uh, and 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 what he said was consistent, I think, with what we heard from Steve Rotherham and Judith Blake and, and other uh, political leaders in the North, is that 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 yes, indeed, um, 
the Secretary of State had spoken and, and ministers had spoken with um, political leaders in the North prior to the announcement. Um, the, the view that was expressed by members at, at, in, in the discussion at the end of July was that, of course, we welcome that they've welcomed, and I think we've all welcomed the announcements about the Northern Transport Acceleration Council, anything that can uh, work to um, accelerate the delivery of transport schemes in the North is something that we should all welcome. But, but what Andy Burnham said, and, and this was echoed by other members in that discussion at the end of July, was that he, he was, he'd made clear to the Secretary of State that, that he didn't want the um, remit of, the, of, of this new body to uh, be at the expense of TFN. So, so there were very supportive comments in discussion at the end of July. That's something, but, but that, what, what that actually means in practice is I think what, what the Chair uh, is wanting to discuss with, with the Secretary of State, with, with, a mem with a member delegation. And the proposal is that that delegation be, uh, well, it's to be confirmed, but I think, I think our expectation, our hope is that it would comprise um, Councillor Judith Blake as Chair of the Members Working Group, uh, Councillor Louise Gittings as Vice Chair, uh, a representative, representative of the Conservative um, members on the board and a representative of uh, the LEPs uh, on the board. So the idea is that we put together a delegation like that that would go with John and either Barry, if he's back, or myself to, to, to well, not go, not physically go, obviously, but to, to have that meeting with the, uh, with the Secretary of State, um, uh, hopefully within the next week or so. I just Thank you very much, Dave. Just been to see who the uh, parachute in as chair of it. <laughs> yeah, well, he said he wants to chair it himself. Uh, I think that was in the okay. announcement, but we'll see. Okay. Are there any, any other questions for, for David or for Ian? If not, then I would, I would like to uh, thank the two of you for putting this forward. I think this document is, um, is paramount in our, in our argument that says that we are critical um, uh, 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 that is transport thought is a critical part of, of the, uh, the government's uh, uh, various things including fighting COVID uh, uh, and I think this is critical that we get this in and we get this into the comprehensive spending review and also we've picked up on where we've lost uh, we've lost uh, VAT which we originally thought that we might have got that um, I think there the needs to be sort of I'm a polite note that goes at the end because in 4.2 you ask us to note uh, that there's a potential disruption to transport for the north, business planning and budgeting process uh, and, and I think it's very clear that we are part of, uh, there's a, a degree of urgency required here um, in the one there's the decarbonisation uh, element of government that they want us to pursue, there's two the economic uh, recovery and three, we're trying to level up the north all at the same time. So I actually uh, welcome the paper, uh, and I, I believe our committee welcomes it from the sentiments that have been placed here. And uh, obviously there's a level of uncertainty and concern uh, around, um, around the introduction of the Northern Transport Acceleration Council, but at the moment all we can do is welcome it and hope that it's uh, something that, give, uh, that, that, shoves, uh, that speeds up our progress. So thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, so now I'd like to move to item eight, and this is where uh, we have to ask for exclusion of the press. So I will read the word, the official wording here. Um, so the reason we wash, wish to exclude the, uh, the press and the public is it is likely in view of the nature of the business to be transacted or the nature of the proceedings that if members of the public were, uh, were present during such items, confidential information as defined in section 100A brackets 2 of the Local Government Act 1972 as amended would be disclosed to them in breach of the obligation of confidence and or uh, um, paragraph 2 it or they may involve uh, the likely disclosure of exempt information as set out in paragraphs where necessarily listed below of Schedule 12A of the Local Government Act 1972 as amended and that the public interest in maintaining the exemption outweighs the public interest in, in disclosing the information. So I, I would ask you, James, now if you could uh, close this.